In regard to the replacement product, what type of guarantees that this has been tested in an area that has the inclement weather that we do, which, you know, the salt air turns everything to dust, uh, and what type of warranties will be those be backed with so that we know the product is going to work. We've seen what's happened with the Bay Bridge and the bolts that were put into that. So I don't hold much value in just, oh, this is a great deal and we got it at a good price type of thing. We need to know that this is going to last if we're investing in it. Uh. As I said in, in response to his question, basically the, it gets replaced with the same kind of system that's powering your house. How often does ele electricity go off in your house? It does. It does. I'm not saying it won't happen, yeah. but it's not going to happen, you know, eight times a year, and it's not going to happen for a month straight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go off and come back on relatively quickly, within hours or days. So the same issue, though, with your house, um, since you, you don't have the frequency of the outages like you do with the streetlights, but it's basically the same thing, usually, that PG&E has a transformer that, you know, blew up and that kind of thing. But for that kind of um, replacement, they usually can access the replacement equipment a lot faster. Yeah. Basically, what it does is it will move the lights from being on an independent circuit to being on the same circuit your house is on. So the only time that light would lose electricity is if your house lost electricity at the same time. Oh, wait, one question over here. On the right, Keenan, 207 Lakeshire Drive. One thing I would like to know is uh, why do we go outside the uh, city with, uh, we have very intelligent people. Why do you have to get the estimates and all that? And that must cost a bundle for that. And then this man, he didn't want street sweeping. Uh, you know, the tires and the cars make a lot of sweep. They, down in uh, Westlake 1, they try to get rid of it. And the government said, no, you've got to sweep up the uh, stuff. And another thing is that if you didn't have it, you would have cars parked in front of your house for three or four weeks. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, do you want to respond to the engineer's estimate? Yeah, to, just to kind of clarify a few things, when Pat was responding to Ms. Kanan's question about bonds, actually if an assessment district does use bond financing, it's just a different financial mechanism to get to the bond. So ultimately you do have a bond and your assessments on your property taxes go to pay the bond off and at some point the bond's paid off and it's done. Um, as far as why we would hire an engineer, because at some point we have to do what's called a Prop 218 vote. We need to get people who know how to do those votes We also and, and handle that vote, because it's not like you, you vote in the general election. You get a postcard in the mail and you mail it back into us. And a person who owns three houses gets to vote three times, because he's got three properties, whereas if you're voting for the president, you get to vote once. Um, so just like with that voting scheme, we need to get people in here who have done that kind of special voting to help us do that, because we've never actually done it before. And that's not uncommon for cities to have to bring in basically hired guns who do this. They go and they help this city, and then they go help this city, and then they go help this city as they go through this process. It's the same with the engineering stuff. We can do a, a if you will, a quick and dirty estimate, but the kind of estimate that people really want to see, which is the real hard money, this is what it's going to cost you. There's a lot of engineering work. That it has to basically have be preliminary designed, and you have to make estimates of bonding costs and underwriting costs and other things that go into the overall project. And our staff are not experts in that. We're not experts in assessment districts. We don't do them on a regular basis, so it's, it's, it's much more efficient to get somebody who does it all the time. Because people do assessment districts all over the state. Uh, I was involved with some assessment districts in another city I worked for, but I can tell you that most of what I knew about it, I had forgotten because they didn't haven't done one for 15 years, and the laws change. And as I mentioned before, we've never done an assessment district, so our engineering staff have no experience doing it at all. So in the long run, it would be it'll be more efficient and cost effective to bring in the experts who can do it like that 
rather than having our staff try and figure it out on their own. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Norman Gordon at 95 Old Chesley Court. And uh, I, I'm a little confused because some numbers have been uh, bandied about and they don't seem to match up. And perhaps you could clarify. The cost for the RO is something like forty to sixty thousand dollars. The cost to replace it is half a million. There are four of them. Yeah, well, that's what I'm asking for some clarification because uh, th there's costs there that I don't see. So he was he was referring to the transformers. Right. Okay. That power. When we talk about the ROs, we're talking about the entire system. So the transformer and everything else related to the street light system. Now, as John mentioned, and we would make every effort to recycle whatever portion of the existing system that we could. So the poles, those don't get old. Uh, the only way that we replace those is if they're damaged, if someone runs into it with a vehicle or something. So there are components of, this, of the system that we could reuse to help keep the cost down. But basically, installing all the circuitry, all the electrical circuitry uh, and put, that would allow for the new transformers, that would be the cost that is the most substantial. But it's for every single light in the entire RO. So each neighborhood, it's every single one of them throughout that entire neighborhood. That's the half a million dollars per RO. And that's just our rough estimate, OK? okay that's our rough estimate. But, uh, then there are just, four just, ROs. Just there are four ROs, but I also saw an estimate of eight to ten million. Yeah. So perhaps that could be clarified. Number one, we're bad because we refer to ROs when we're talking about the transformer itself and RO when we're talking to the entire circuitry, right? They're, they're not the same thing. It's the, when we're talking about the, the, the entire regulated output circuitry system, that's the half a million dollars. When we're talking about the RO as a transformer itself, that's the forty to sixty thousand dollars. What was the second part of the question? Well, the, the, our estimate. Well, we looked at the, the, the ninety-nine million. study. Oh yeah. Okay. And half, it's about a half a million per dollars per in rough numbers per RO. We have fifteen of them in the city. There's only four that are big problems right now. So. We, to do those four problematic ones, we'd need about $2 million. If we were going to try to do all 15, we'd need about six and a half, seven million dollars. Okay, thank you. That clarifies it. And we have to go back to the map where I said And, there's and the estimate back then right. was to replace all of them. So when we calculated it from $1999 to the present, that's where that number came from. So then just to ask you a question, how many... Okay, how hang on, hang on. <laughs> Sorry, just to ask you this question then, how many transformers are there in that part of the city that we are, that we are living in? There's one transformer for each RO circuit, so there's 15 in the city. So there are 15 in that area? No, in a four, there's only four. There's four. For each RO. Yeah. So it's the big transformer, but it serves all of the lights that are on the circuit. Okay, so it's one in each area, but there's lots of different light poles that encompass the entire system that feeds off power from that transformer. So then, so, so then just to follow up on your question is that there are <clears throat> four of them that needs to be changed. That's going to cost about 10, around about 10 million. No, but that's okay. that. Okay, hang on. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the electrical system that connects. Okay, so the circuitry that goes to the transformer and gets the power and then redistributes it around all the all of the system to each light pole. That circuitry is what has to be replaced. PG&E mentioned, once we replace the circuitry, then they will come in and replace the transformers. That'll be their responsibility to bring in the new transformers, but the cost that we're talking about is to pull out all of that wiring that currently exists that connects every single one of the streetlights in all four of those RO sections, 
pull all of that out, and then rerun the parallel system that would have to be reinstalled through all four of those RO sections. Okay? I'm Sandra Gordon at 95 Old Chasey's Court. Um, my question was, what decision um, was made by the council last evening um, in, in replacing, or who would, what company would be replacing, um, you know, the system? So there were two, uh, you know, um, companies that one was PG&E, the other one I can't remember right now, but Tenko, yes. So is that a final decision? So for those of you who weren't here at the council meeting or watching us on TV last night, um, we had uh, an item before the council to do a, a street light um, LED conversion. So I'm going to let John explain to you how that's different than what we're talking about. The decision that we made last night has nothing to do with ROs. In fact, if you don't do a circuit conversion, you really can't put LED lights on an RO circuit. You have to convert to a different voltage to begin with because they don't make LED lights that work on that kind of voltage. So the decision last night was a complete, it's basically, it was a decision that affects all the white part of the map, not the pink. The decision we made was to, would affect about a third of the lights in all of the white part of the map because that's the only place we can do LEDs right now. We can't do LEDs in the pink at all. So basically, the decision last night had nothing to do with ROs. How is that going to be so, so, so for those of you who don't know what an LED is and what that means, it means that we are converting a certain number of lights in a portion of the wide area um, uh, into more energy efficient lights. Okay, so we're gonna be able to save energy costs by installing these LED lights as opposed to the other standard lights that we have right now. Um, so PG&E has a program uh, that funds those kinds of projects. Um, and so we have applied and got accepted for, the, for this particular program through PG&E, but it, they only provide up to a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. That doesn't cover every single street light that we have in the white area to do the conversion. It only does a portion of them, about a third, you said. So that's what the project was that what the council approved last night. The individual that came up and said, I can do it for less costs, mm, not so. So John, you want to explain why that uh, was exactly? The, with all due respect to the representative from Tanko Lighting, he was just desperate to get a job. I don't think that Tanko can really do anything significantly cheaper than what PGD can. The way that project is paid for is that essentially we get a free loan from PGE. PGE replaces all one third of the lights in our other side of the system. We immediately start saving electrical energy. So our bill should go down. It doesn't go down because PG&E gets to get their money back that they loaned us by taking the difference in our PG&E bill until they get paid back. So basically, it's a net no loss to us. It basically takes money that we would normally pay for our more cost, our more expensive lights. It PG&E pays us, basically does the conversion for us, and then they get the savings from the cheaper lights until they get paid back, and then after that, we get actually a lower PG&E bill. Takes about three and a half years in, in, for that particular project before PGE recoups their money back. Wish we could do that for the ROs. Wish you could. Yeah. Oh. I'm Daniel Heron. I live at 342 North Haven Drive. I have two questions. One, what are you guys doing about the problem today? Today, the problem is I come home at night. And I try to back in my driveway in the heavy fog, no street lights, very difficult. And even worse is in the morning when my wife leaves for work, there's people walking down the street with flashlights. I've heard stories of people that have fallen. I've heard stories from neighbors of people who claim their car got hit and it probably was somebody maybe backing out of a driveway when we had the heavy fog days that didn't see they were that close because there's no street lights. It's almost impossible to see. And 
<clears throat> I don't see anything being done to help that problem, and I can't imagine that somebody is not going to trip and fall walking down the street that's not going to try to soothe the city, or has maybe they already have. But there's going to be a lot of problems, and you're talking weeks that this is going to go on. It's been going on for weeks, months in some areas. And then my second question is, okay, what is a, a realistic time frame to get this thing passed, for us to vote on it, and for the lights to start to be replaced? Are we talking months? Are we talking a year? I mean, what, what, what's the time frame? You guys aren't given any time frame. Okay, if, if the council were to direct us to proceed with an assessment district, and we did all the preliminary work that I told you, and it went to the vote, and it got approved, um, it would probably be a two-year process uh, because forming the assessment district will... From today. From the date that we from actually have a vote. But yeah. from today, yeah. the council may not make a decision about this until... That, that's what I'm asking. You know, How long until we, we would actually get the vote on this um, for an assessment? Are you talking a month, two months, six months? In, yeah. in a perfect world if we go to back to the council with a report about all the public input that we've received in September and this council makes a decision to for us to do something um, then we from that point on we would begin if they tell us that they'd like us to put together all the materials uh, to put to a vote the assessment district it will probably take us probably about six to nine months or longer to do that um, then we would come back, then they, we'd have the public hearing, and then once the council approves moving forward, then the ballots would go out, uh, and then we would get the ballots back, determine whether or not we got 51% of the voters, and then if we did, we would proceed along to do what we've been talking about tonight. So we're talking about, and I said that up front, we're talking about at least a two-year process from the time we would actually go down that road if we got the approval till you having brand new lights turn on that hopefully will not create any more problems for a very, very long period of time, if ever. Excuse me, one, let me ask. Verda Rozier, 542 Westmore Avenue. Um, I've been in Daly City at the same house for 40 years now. The neighborhood is not the same as it used to be. I know that the lights aren't causing more crime, but we have so many more people in the city than we had when I was growing up. And the crime has definitely gone up. We've had vehicles get you know, broken into. We've had, you know, just there's a lot of different crime. I have a 71-year-old mother, a 26-year-old daughter, and a six-year-old granddaughter, and myself that live in the house. And it's just females. If somebody was to come to my house on a foggy night with no street lights and break in, nobody is going to be able to tell you what they look like. For one, the fog, and for two, there's no street lights. You cannot see, especially on a foggy night. I could stand next to a tree and I wouldn't know if it was a tree or a person. And for a woman, it's scary. I personally, I have been sexually assaulted. And it's not something that, you know, I want my daughter to go through. The parking is terrible. So sometimes you have to walk blocks just to get home. I will go park my car blocks and walk myself before I let my daughter and my granddaughter walk blocks. But it's, it's scary out there. And yeah, people get into accidents, but I, and then this has been an issue going on for a long time. We can all say, hey, you should have done something about it before, but we're talking about now. It hasn't been. I think it's an issue that everybody really needs to stop and think about the safety of the community. And, and I live in those red areas, and I've lived in that red area for 40 years. And it's been an issue for a long time, but the, the amount of people that have moved in is significantly higher. People don't know their neighbors anymore. The neighbors aren't looking out for each other like they used to when I was growing up. So it's, it's scary. I certainly appreciate uh, those comments. And, and as I mentioned earlier, that's the reason why we are having this meeting. And that's why we are at the point, um, and we were in March when um, after the winter period, you know, December, January, and uh, we kept having these multiple outages over and over and over again. We get them fixed and then it'd be out. Um, I finally said to the staff, we gotta, we gotta come up with a solution. We gotta do something. And that's why we went to the council and talked about some of these same issues and that's when they directed us to come back out. So I share your concern. 
Um, I've seen the problem for a number of years, and as I said to you before, if it was in my power and the power of the council to just write a check instantly, we, w we would have done it. Uh, it's not that easy. Um, and so we're trying to find a solution that will work. We're trying to find something that will be reasonable. Um, and, and you know, one other thing I, I would mention, because I know, okay, and I can tell just by the look on some of your faces and some of the comments, nobody wants to pay more money. I get that. I'm a taxpayer too. I, I know how everybody feels. Um, and I am proud to say that in the time that I've been in Daly City, you know, working here and running this local government here, we have not um, raised taxes for people. Many, many cities during the recession, you know, 2007, 8, many cities in this county raised their sales tax because they lost so much revenue that they had tax measures and there, half a dozen or more cities in this county were successful in raising their sales tax. We didn't. We figured out a way to live within our means. Has there been impacts? Yes. Are there things that we had to cut back on? Yes. Are we spending as much money improving some of our city facilities and doing other things the way we really would like to? No, we're not, because we had to cut back. But we cut back. We didn't go to the voters. We didn't say, we need you to pay more so we can do this. We made cuts. We have lived within the means that we have available. And it's hard, because we're the biggest city in the county with the biggest population and the biggest set of needs in terms of services. It's hard, but we've done that. Um, and so we aren't the kind of city that every time we need to do something, we go to, the, to our residents and say, you've got to pay more. You've got to pay more here. You're gonna, we're going to raise your taxes here. We don't do that. If it wasn't a situation that I really do believe is dire at this point because of what you all are going through, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's a really serious problem. I understand it. But without some sort of support, from the people who are gonna benefit from a new system, it's gonna be hard for us to just replace it right away. That's basically the crossroads that we have arrived at and the reasons for it. Um, and, and again, we don't take it lightly and that's why the council asked me to have these meetings and to do outreach and all that because they don't take the idea of asking our residents to pay more for anything lightly. They don't take it lightly. So please understand that we wouldn't be asking if there was some easy alternative that we had that we could just fix it, because if there was, we would have already done that. Can I stand up? Yes. Okay. Uh, National Night Out, are you familiar with it? If not, we now have Daily City's National Night Out, and we have one month before it takes place. Uh, Sandra Gordon at 95 Old Chasey. Um, that's only one thing I'd like to make mention, but we need neighbor to neighbor. We need to reach out to our neighbors on our street to get this issue, you know, solved by us, the citizens. And so one way is talk with them, um, invite them on National Night Out, uh, you know, and if we can get print out information to distribute, that would help as well. Um, if you have suggestions, you know, we're community. Let's get together and talk about it. Um, so this, this is something that I'm, you know, been thinking of and um, we, we got to solve it now. <laughs> Andrew McCarran, 68 Menlo Avenue. Um, I was just curious, uh, two things. One, has the issue been more on pg and &E side or has it been more on Daly City side or is it like a 50-50 thing? I know there's no like set thing. And then the second thing too, um, I just want to say that uh, I've been in Daly City 20 years and um, when you guys came out with the work order system a couple of years ago online, I thought that was terrific. I've submitted many work orders. They're usually, um, I, in some cases, they've been dealt with in a couple hours and most of the time it's a couple of days. and I work for the city of San Francisco, and the system here works very efficiently. <laughs> I, I want to give you guys kudos and everything for it and everything. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
It's hard to answer the question, is it mostly on pg and A's side or mostly on the city side? Because in my opinion, it's mostly on pg and A's side. In pg and A's opinion, it's mostly on our side. What a surprise, right? The reality is these systems are old. And as we go into the future, it's, it's going to be more and more probably just taking turns. I think the, the most recent problems we've had are more on pg and &E's side, my opinion. I'm sure in, when we had, I've, we'll say the opposite. I was in a five hour meeting with the California Public Utilities Commission with pg &E reps on one side, me on the other side, and CPUC people at the end of the table. And those meetings got pretty testy on who thought who was at fault because these systems are really old and there's not a lot of people that know a lot about them anymore. You know, the, the knowledge within the PG organization, for example, starting to drift away as older hands dealt with these systems for many years are retiring out. Um, and because the systems are getting older, they're getting more problems when they're losing the people who really know how to deal with them the best. Uh, and I don't blame pg &E for, say, not wanting to reinvest in trying to train people for this because it represents about that much of their system. I mean, this is a tiny speck pg and &E system. So it, it's really hard to say who's, who's at fault. And I don't want to throw pg and &E at the bus. I could do that, but I'm not going to. Um, you know, and just to follow up on that, um, you know, when it, when it comes to the city's fault in terms of uh, it being part of the circuitry, um, you know, it, an issue, uh, because as John mentioned, if it's just a light, we replace the light instantly, and that's the first thing we look at. Um, that's not the problem. The circuitry, though, is a very complex issue because, as I mentioned, you know, the circuitry is like a Christmas tree set of lights, you know, so the staff have to go from one point to the next to the next until they find where the problems are. So um, does it take our staff time to do that? Yes, it does. Um, but it's just the nature of the system because it is a more complex electrical circuitry than it would be if we were to install a newer system. Other questions? OK, let me go back here. Well, didn't uh, a slightly change uh, subject that's still kind of related, uh, you have a lot of property that hasn't been developed for a long time, are, is that being looked at as a possible way with assessment fees to the builders for the development of that that could be utilized toward uh, some of this expense? For example, right across the street from where I'm working, you have right there between Arco uh, gas station and, uh, or excuse me, the uh, Flyers and uh, Westlake Avenue, you have that one second that's supposed to be redeveloped that hasn't been done for quite a few, and which I understand because of the recession. And then there's other properties too around the city that uh, I noticed today when I was coming uh, to work that back there where the uh, scavenger company's uh, property, there's some uh, tear down of, of the land there and there's some progress happening there with something. Is that something that could be used in regards to the developers adding something, even though it's, it is our area and we don't have much for development, that it could be uh, utilized that way? So first of all, real quick, without spending too much time, because we are getting past uh, our uh, agreed upon uh, program time, um, the redevelopment properties in the city no longer belong to the city. The governor eliminated redevelopment now, what was it, three years ago? Three years ago. Um, and when that happened, all of the redevelopment property in the city, including the property um, across from Pacific Plaza, next to the Kiss and Rides uh, station over by BART that we were going to build, where we were going to build a hotel, and the one on Westlake Avenue, we we're planning to have a, uh, an office building uh, to create new jobs built there. That redevelopment land all became the ownership of the state. So the city no longer owns that land. What's going to happen is the state of California has yet to approve a property management plan, um, a disposition plan, that will allow us, hopefully, to sell the land. But when we sell the land, unlike when we had a redevelopment agency, we kept the proceeds from it. And then we used that to develop a lot of things. And we did infrastructure. We did water system improvements. We did a lot of things in the city with that money 
to help improve Daly City. We can't do that now. Now, remember that dollar bill I put up there and it showed you how the dollars have to be you know, divided up? Now, when that land gets sold, it has to be divided up like that. All the taxing entities get their piece. So the county will get some, the school districts, the special districts, and then Daly City will get its little piece. And actually, um, on redevelopment property, it's even less than property tax. It'll be 13 cents on the dollar that we'll get back. Um, so it's not like we're going to get a big windfall. You know, we'll get some funds that will be used, and that will be used for general fund purposes. But it wouldn't be enough to, to pay for this, and we don't know when we're going to be able to sell those properties. How does the uh, they just dissolved our redevelopment agency along with every other redevelopment agencies in the state. They passed a law and they said now all of that comes back to us. That's, that's how, how they did it. That's how they did it. And that's why they have a huge surplus and we don't. Okay. Um, sure, let me get this one and then you. Okay. If I'm getting this meeting correctly, what you guys were hoping will do is go back in our neighborhoods and tell everybody about this and suggest that the uh, <clears throat> by taking a two-year little project would be the best form in, in fixing the light problems. But one thing everybody's going to ask me if I talk to the people in my neighborhood about this is on question 10, you have four different amounts or five different amounts if you count zero. And they're going to want to know, are we at the 21 to 25 realistically? Are we at the five to 10 realistically? Because that's gonna change a lot of people's votes. Five to 10, a lot of people could say, I could pay that for a few months, a couple years, but you're talking 25, $30, they're gonna say, well, I don't know. So, I mean, I'd at least like to know which way you're leaning, the way you think, so at least I can be honest with you. So, first of all, um, those numbers were just intended to gauge whether or not people would be willing to participate in helping to, to pay the cost for these street lights that you are going to benefit from. So first of all, um, those are monthly amounts. Um, and when you pay your property taxes, it's an annual amount. So, so it would really be times 12, whatever that is. Um, and it was for us to gain a sense of what is the threshold by which people would. But you have an idea of what it's going to cost. Well, we have a, we have a, well, right. We have a rough estimate. There are in the neighborhood. If exactly. Vote yes, you would know what it would cost us. Right. Exactly. Cost and us. we will know that before we actually but went saying, forward. But right the reason now, why we put that, hang on, hang on one sec. The reason we put that is to gauge the willingness of people to help pay for it. Okay. And it might be, you know, that people would only be willing to pay a very small amount. Well, we're going to know that then. So as we calculate what people's responses are, we're going to know how many people were willing to spend 5 or $10 and how many were willing to spend $25. So we'll know the range. When we calculate the true cost spread across all parcels, then when we go look at what people were willing to spend, we're going to have a real sense of whether or not this is going to pass or not. Because if people said, I'm only willing to spend $5, and it ends up being that it's actually going to cost $15, then we're going to have a sense that this might not fly. So that's the reason we put it to inform ourselves about what the likelihood is. And when you, when you ha do a vote like this, you have to do some preliminaries to try and understand <coughs> Will the voters support this? They do it for all kinds of initiatives. And this is our way of gauging whether or not there is a likelihood that people are going to be willing to support <coughs> this kind of thing at that level. And if not, then we have to figure out a way that we can make it more palatable to people. So That's all. Is right now, you guys, I'm sure, probably know. You know how many houses we're talking about. You know how many it's just going to mm -hmm. cost approximately for the lights. You could probably cut this down to say it's going to be between twenty and forty dollars, or, or or at least. You Don't say forty. Don't okay. Say 40. What I'm saying is, most people when they look at this are going to say, "Oh, I'll do five and ten. Mm -hmm. But maybe they would really do fifteen to twenty, but they wouldn't do any higher than that. So you're giving them. If you go back and say everybody's going to put five to ten because nobody wants to pay more, so everybody's going to take the cheapest amount. 
you're not going to get an accurate amount by this anyway. Just come up and tell us. You got paid 20 bucks a month for three years, and that's going to fix your life problem. How many households are there approximately that will be paying for? About. But you said 8,500. About 3,000. Yeah. Right. So right on that map, it's about 3,000. Yeah. But, but the, the uh, assessment district that you would postulate would be all of the ROs or just the red ones? Just the red ones. Just, just the red ones. Right now, we're just doing the red. So it would only be the red ones. Those are the ones that are most severely affected. And how many properties are so, there? About, about 3,000. There's about 3,000. The number that we use, though, that calculated. We were talking about how many people, how many people actually live in the area. So for each parcel, there's more than one person. So, so it's a larger population that's affected than the actual parcel owners. So it's the property owners that will end up paying, and that's why, you know, we we wanted a sense of what, you know, some reasonable basis that we could think that people might support it or not. So we don't know. We will find out, and we'll have a better sense of it. Um, I do have to say that there are those who do empirical research who, who overrode me in, in putting those numbers together like that because I didn't think it was a good approach myself. But there are those who do empirical research who felt like that would give us a better sense of what the public's thinking around this was. So that's how we did it. But, but it's not intended to make a decision based on that. It's just intended to give us a sense of the sentiment of people. Well, we will give them a number, but we're not there yet. I mean, you, you all have listened, and I appreciate that very much. It doesn't mean that you would all vote for it. I realize that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you would all be opposed to it. I, I hope that that's the case. So in any given group of people, there's going to be those who maybe support it, absolutely don't support it, absolutely do support it. So we have to gauge the broader <coughs> sentiment. But if we go forward, if the city council makes a decision and gives me direction to go put the engineer's report together so we can empirically find out what the cost would be and what voters would ha would be agreeing to pay for, you will have that number so crystal we'll clear. Have number before you vote. Before yeah. you vote. So when you hand us the thing to vote, it'll say you're agreeing to three years right. at seven. Absolutely. The vote will be, would you be willing to pay X for X number of years to support, you know, an assessment district to do X, Y, Z. It would all be spelled out in black and white. It really okay. puts the, the owner between a hard place and a rock, though, because it's either you're going to have to vote on something to pay because otherwise the system is not going to be remedied. Not as quickly. The, the difference is speed. Speed, because like I told you, the council can make a decision that we allocate some amount of dollars, putting it away so that we can begin the process. But it's not going to be a process that's going to be completed in a relatively short period of time. What kind of matching funds will there be, or will there be? Or? Well, let me, okay, one second, sure. So that, that's a question as well. Um, and depending upon what the overall cost of the assessment district would be. Um, and when we determine exactly, you know, how many parcels and that kind of thing, and we weigh some of the information that we get with people filling out the survey of what they would be willing to pay, then the council may make a decision at that point in time that the city will participate by contributing X. It won't be the total cost, but it'll be some portion of the cost in order to lower what the assessment would be. What that number is, I can't tell you because I don't know the exact number that it would cost to replace the entire system. But my guess is that that will be one of the things that the council will look at is whether or not the city can afford to contribute something to bring down the cost. I have a question for the city. Why are you asking us to vote on putting in an adequated system in the parts that are out now, but you're considering putting in an LED system in a white section that contains apartment buildings, shopping centers, and everything? And PG&E is willing to go in partners with you for the LED. Why are you not considering the LED for our areas? Well, first of all, if we replace the entire system, 
then you will have LEDs. We would do LEDs. We will do LEDs. We can't put them in in a system like you have now because it would be pouring good money after bad, okay? It would be because the system is not functioning at an optimal level. In the areas where we are going to put the LED, it's only for the lights, Sharon. It's only for the lights to make them energy efficient lights. It's not replacing the system. It's just the light bulbs that will change that make them more energy efficient. But when we would install a new system in your areas, we would put the absolute state of the art, new transformers, new energy efficient lights. It will be a state of the art system. Well, their system is older than our system, so why should their system be well enough for LED? And our system being uh, newer is not. Because that's the way the system was built. When Westlake was built, it was built with high voltage street lights, these RO street lights. The old original Daly City wasn't. It was built with the same kind of electrical, light, electrical system that powers your house. That's the way most street lights in PG&E's service area are. You heard Scott tell you there's hardly any of these ROs in their whole service area. I never even heard of an RO until I came to Daly City. I've worked in public works for 30 plus years. I never heard of an RO until I got here. You know, everything I know about ROs I've learned in the last six years since I've been here because these things don't exist anywhere else. With, the price of converting a regular light, right, like a high pressure sodium light, to an LED light is a couple hundred dollars per light. That's chump change compared to the cost of rewiring the, the poles. We can, we can actually convert every light in the white part of the map to LED for the price of converting like one and a half ROs to, low, to lower voltage. So we would, that would just be a given. We'd put LED in when we did it. It's not any, that much more money. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Rayong. 277 Bellhaven. Uh, so in the meantime, we're not going to be sitting in the dark now, are we? For the For 366 until that new transformer comes in, yes. Okay, so, so when... Because we're out at 406. I didn't even know 406 was currently out. How long have you been out? talked to a lot of people. He talks to Jeff Renese. Jeff Renese actually <laughs> talks to the calls. But you were telling me you were going to talk to the PUC. We did. Well, then that was me. Yeah. <laughs> and we had the squatters, and you asked if we called the police. 406. 406. Is out and it's been out for months. Okay, John. Well, you're going to have to find out and John's going to provide an answer as to when you can uh, expect that to be replaced. So, so the so next steps before we conclude. Um, the next steps are we're going to compile all the public input from this meeting and from the surveys and from the comments that we continue to get back from people. We're going to provide the city council with a summary report of the input that we've gotten. Um, and we're going to recommend what potential future action the council should consider. That doesn't mean we're doing anything. It just means we'll lay out what they, we think they should do and then the council will decide whether or not they want us to proceed in that way or to study some other alternatives, 
or to uh, come up with a different set of options. So, so that's going to happen in the next few months. By September, we will report back to the council whatever they decide and give us direction to do. We're going to continue to keep you in the loop in all the means that we have been providing you with information so you'll know every step of the way. When we go to the council, you'll have, we'll make a link so that you can have a copy of the report that we're going to take to the council and lay out what all the input was and what we recommend should be their, you know, um, direction, to, you know, about how we should proceed. Daily City National Night Out. And Daily City National Night Out is August 4th uh, at, at Ceremony Shop. So please come and participate, and we'll have information about this available at that time as well. Last thing, thank you all very much. I, I really appreciate how you all were very respectful, how you listened, you asked really good questions. And as I said at the beginning, I feel your pain. I know that this has been a real problem, but I really appreciate your patience with us and the way that you gave us your attention tonight. It was very much appreciated. Thank you so much.